if it wasn't for you people who were down there and did that, believe me, I know in my heart that I wouldn't be here today. I didn't know what I was getting into. That's how I feel. Had I known what I was getting into, I wouldn't have it. I wouldn't have this coming. Richard Pryor, the legendary comedian and writer who paved the way for talents like Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock, captivated audiences with his unparalleled wit. He rose to fame and became the most celebrated comedian of his time, despite his turbulent childhood and traumatic past. Yet, behind his laughter, Pryor couldn't escape his troubled upbringing, which influenced his poor decisions that ultimately impacted his quality of life, resulting in his death. Richard Pryor's life was a whirlwind of chaos and intrigue, and in this video, we delve deeper into his life and give you a full detail of his tragic death and personal struggles. Let's dive in. Turbulent Early Life Before we delve into the revelations, we must understand how Richard became the man he was. Pryor was born in Peoria, Illinois on December 1, 1940. Raised in his grandmother Marie Carter's brothel, where his mother Gertrude L. Nee Thomas worked as a prostitute, Pryor had a tumultuous upbringing. His father, Leroy Buck Carter Pryor, was a former boxer, hustler, and pimp. Exposed to substance abuse and criminality from a young age, Pryor's upbringing was far from typical. He recalls moments of peering through keyholes. Now, I used to peek through keyholes to watch people, and it messed me up. Witnessing scenes that left a lasting impact on him, Despite occasional affection from his mother, her behavior of entertaining clients before attending to Pryor left him deeply unsettled. The absence of warmth from his father and grandmother forced Pryor to tread carefully, fearing their harsh discipline. This familial discord underscored the instability of Richard's upbringing. After his mother left when he was 10, Pryor was primarily raised by his grandmother, a stern woman who didn't hesitate to discipline him for his quirks. Growing up in the brothel alongside three siblings, Pryor endured sexual abuse at the age of seven and was expelled from school at 14. At just 15 years old, Pryor faced the challenges of parenthood himself. Seeking guidance from his own father, Pryor navigated the complexities of adulthood amidst ongoing family turmoil and dysfunctionality. Left under the stern care of his grandmother after his mother's departure, Pryor's feelings of abandonment lingered and will later affect his future relationships. Pryor served in the U.S. Army from 1958 to 1960, but spent the majority of his service in military prison following an altercation in West Germany. A 1999 New Yorker profile on Pryor said that he was imprisoned due to an event that happened while he was stationed in West Germany. Pryor and several other black soldiers beat and stabbed a white soldier, but not fatally, because they were upset that he found the racially charged parts in Douglas Sirk's film Imitation of Life to be unduly funny. He became a Prince Hall Freemason while a member of Peoria's Henry Brown Lodge Nun 22. Despite the chaos, Pryor found refuge in comedy, using humor as a coping mechanism. Drawing inspiration from comedians like Jerry Lewis, Pryor honed his comedic skills, developing a unique style rooted in authenticity rather than imitation. Reflecting on Pryor's challenging early life, one could only wonder how he moved from his humble beginnings in a poverty-stricken brothel to becoming one of the most celebrated comedians of his time. Well, keep watching to know. Journey into comedy and early career. Richard Pryor's comedic journey was deeply intertwined with his tumultuous upbringing, serving as a way to confront life's complexities through humor. In 1963, Pryor relocated to New York City, where he commenced regular performances at clubs alongside notable artists such as Bob Dylan and Woody Allen. During one of his early gigs, he had the opportunity to open for the acclaimed singer and pianist Nina Simone at New York's Village Gate. Simone vividly recalls Pryor's extreme nervousness, likening his trembling to that of someone afflicted with malaria. She provided comfort by embracing him in the darkness of the venue, soothing him like a child until he regained composure. Despite his initial anxiety, Pryor continued to perform regularly, drawing inspiration from Bill Cosby. Initially, his comedy material was more conventional, 
and he made appearances on popular television variety shows such as The Ed Sullivan Show, The Merv Griffin Show, and The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. Pryor's rising popularity paved the way for success in Las Vegas as a comedian. The early recordings on the compilation CD Evolution titled The Early Years, 1966-1974, offer a glimpse into this phase of Pryor's career, with tracks dating back to 1966 and 1967. In 1966, he even made a guest appearance on an episode of The Wild Wild West. While he found some success with his talent for impersonation and storytelling, Pryor grew increasingly disenchanted with maintaining a family-friendly image that didn't align with his true self. In a pivotal moment in September 1967, Pryor experienced what he later described as an epiphany. During a performance at the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas, in front of a packed audience that included Dean Martin, Pryor abruptly questioned his presence on stage, exclaiming profanely, he said into the microphone, what the fuck am I doing here? and walked off the stage. He abruptly stopped the performance, realizing he couldn't continue pretending to be someone he wasn't. Walking off stage, Pryor made a firm decision to embrace his authentic identity without reservation. This marked a significant turning point in his career, as Pryor began incorporating profanity and controversial topics, including the racially charged word nigger into his act. His debut comedy recording, Richard Pryor, on the Dove Reprise label, released in 1968, reflects this transformative period in his comedic style. Seeking escape from the constraints of mainstream comedy, Pryor ventured to Berkeley's counterculture scene, where he sought to cultivate his unique voice. He later made friends with individuals such as Ishmael Reed and Huey P. Newton. Immersed in this subversive environment, he fearlessly tackled taboo topics, infusing his comedy with daring social commentary. Drawing from his challenging upbringing, which included experiences in brothel life, encounters with pimp culture, and battles with substance abuse, Pryor turned personal adversities into comedic brilliance. His candidness, originality, and defiance of societal norms earned him admiration from diverse audiences. Career breakthrough and rise to stardom, during the 1970s, Pryor ventured into television writing, contributing to popular shows such as Sanford and Son, The Flip Wilson Show, and a 1973 Lily Tomlin special, earning him a shared Emmy Award. Concurrently, he made efforts to establish himself in mainstream television and film. Pryor appeared in various movies during this period, including Lady Sings the Blues, the Mac, Uptown Saturday Night, Silver Streak, Car Wash, Bingo Long, Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings, Which Way Is Up, Greased Lightning, Blue Collar, and The Muppet Movie. In 1970, Pryor inked a deal with the comedy-focused independent record label Laugh Records and subsequently released his second album, Craps, After Hours, in 1971. Despite still being relatively unknown, Pryor made a notable appearance in the documentary Watt Stacks, 1972, where he humorously tackled the complexities of race relations in Watts and the United States. Shortly thereafter, Pryor sought a contract with a larger label, ultimately signing with Stax Records in 1973. However, a dispute arose with Laugh Records, which claimed ownership of Pryor's recording rights. This conflict almost resulted in an injunction to halt the sale of Pryor's third breakthrough album, That Nigger's Crazy, 1974. Negotiations ensued, leading to Pryor's release from his contract with Laugh Records. In exchange, Laugh gained the right to release previously unreleased material recorded between 1968 and 1973. Despite the controversy, That Nigger's Crazy achieved both commercial success and critical acclaim, eventually earning gold certification from the RIAA and winning the Grammy Award for Best Comedy Album at the 1975 Grammy Awards. Amidst the legal turmoil, Stax Records temporarily shuttered its operations. During this period, Pryor returned to reprise Warner Brothers Records, where That Nigger's Crazy was re-released shortly after his inaugural album with the label, Is It Something I Said? Similar to the reception of That Nigger's Crazy, 
Pryor's new album garnered critical acclaim and achieved platinum certification from the RIAA. It also clinched the Grammy Award for Best Comedy Recording at the 1976 Grammy Awards. In 1976, Pryor's release of Bicentennial Nigger marked another triumph in his career. The album became his third consecutive gold-certified album, and Pryor secured his third consecutive Grammy for Best Comedy Recording in 1977. As Pryor's popularity soared with each successful album under Warner's banner, and later with his concert films in the aftermath of his 1980 freebasing incident, Laugh Records capitalized on his growing fame by releasing albums featuring older material, a practice they continued until 1983. The cover art of these Laugh albums often tied in thematically with Pryor's cinematic endeavors, such as Are You Serious for Silver Streak, The Wizard of Comedy for his role in The Wiz, and Insane for Stir Crazy. Additionally, Pryor collaborated on the screenplay of Blazing Saddles, directed by Mel Brooks and starring Gene Wilder. While Pryor was initially slated to play the lead role of Bart, the film's production studio declined to ensure him, prompting Mel Brooks to cast Cleavon Little in the role instead. In 1975, Pryor made television history as the first black individual to host Saturday Night Live SNL, during its inaugural season. Sharing the stage with his longtime girlfriend, actress, and talk show host Catherine McKee, the sister of Lynette McKee, Pryor's appearance on SNL included a memorable and controversial word association skit with Chevy Chase. This marked a significant moment in television entertainment. Following this achievement, Pryor ventured into his own variety show, The Richard Pryor Show, which debuted on NBC in 1977. Despite his immense talent and popularity, the show faced a premature end after just four episodes. It's speculated that television audiences weren't receptive to the controversial themes tackled in Pryor's show, and Pryor himself was unwilling to compromise his material to adhere to network censorship. Reflecting on the experience, Pryor remarked, They offered me ten episodes, but I said all I wanted to in four. Despite its short run, the series showcased Pryor's versatility, featuring sketches where he portrayed the first black president of the United States, parodied scenes from Star Wars, addressed gun violence in a serious skit, satirized racism aboard the Titanic, and even utilized costumes and visual effects to create humorous nude appearances. In 1979, amid the peak of his career, Pryor embarked on a transformative journey to Kenya. Upon his return to the United States from Africa, Pryor made a solemn vow never to include the word nigger in his stand-up comedy routine again, marking a significant personal and artistic decision. Meanwhile, Pryor also faced personal loss during this time, with the passing of both his mother in 1967 and his father in 1968. Successful career with bigger paychecks. In 1980, Pryor achieved a groundbreaking milestone in Hollywood by becoming the first black actor to command a million-dollar paycheck for a single film, Stir Crazy. However, tragedy struck during the production of the film on June 9, 1980, when Pryor, amidst a freebasing binge, accidentally set himself ablaze after dousing himself in rum. Pryor later incorporated this harrowing incident into his comedy routine in Richard Pryor, Live on the Sunset Strip, 1982, humorously attributing the mishap to dunking a cookie into low-fat, pasteurized milk, resulting in an explosive reaction. Despite the severity of the incident, Pryor managed to find comedic relief, joking about it during his performance. Before the freebasing accident, Pryor was slated to star in Mel Brooks' History of the World Part 1 but was replaced by Gregory Hines at the 11th hour. Similarly, he was scheduled to appear on The Muppet Show around that time, leading the producers to enlist their British writer, Chris Langham, as the guest star instead. Following his recovery, Pryor wasted no time in returning to the stage. Within a year, he released a new concert film and album, Richard Pryor, Here and Now, which he directed himself. Additionally, he penned and directed Jojo Dancer, Your Life is Calling, 
a fictionalized account of his experiences inspired by the freebasing incident of 1980. In 1983, Pryor inked a lucrative five-year deal with Columbia Pictures worth $40 million and established his own production company, Indigo Productions. Despite his rough roots, Pryor ventured into softer, more formulaic films such as Superman III, Brewster's Millions, Moving, and See No Evil, Hear No Evil, which earned him substantial paychecks. Notably, Pryor's semi-autobiographical debut as a writer-director, Joe Joe Dancer, Your Life is Calling, did not achieve significant success. Additionally, Pryor was initially considered for the role of Billy Ray Valentine in Trading Places before Eddie Murphy ultimately secured the part. Despite his reputation for using profanity both on and off camera, Pryor briefly hosted a children's show on CBS titled Pryor's Place in 1984. Similar to Sesame Street, Pryor's Place featured a cast of puppets animated by Sid and Marty Croft, engaging in fun activities in an urban setting alongside children and characters portrayed by Pryor himself. Not minding its attempt to address serious issues, Pryor's Place was canceled shortly after its debut. Pryor had the honor of co-hosting the Academy Awards twice, first at the 49th Academy Awards in 1977, alongside Warren Beatty, Ellen Burstyn, and Jane Fonda, and then again at the 55th Academy Awards in 1983, alongside Liza Minnelli, Dudley Moore, and Walter Matthau. Additionally, Pryor received a Primetime Emmy Award nomination for Outstanding Guest Actor in a Drama Series for his role on the television series Chicago Hope. However, Pryor's penchant for profanity posed challenges during his appearances at the Academy Awards. Following an early slip-up in the program, network censors implemented a rare five-second delay after commercial breaks to mitigate any further incidents. Notably, Pryor's appearance on Saturday Night Live in 1975 also warranted a similar delay, making him one of only three hosts in the show's history to receive this treatment. Behind the scenes, Pryor developed a reputation for being demanding and disrespectful on film sets, often making selfish and difficult requests. Gene Wilder, his co-star in Stir Crazy, recounted instances of Pryor's tardiness and demanding behavior, including extravagant requests such as a helicopter to transport him to and from the set. Pryor was also accused of leveraging allegations of onset racism to negotiate higher pay, as exemplified by an incident involving watermelon during the filming of Stir Crazy. Despite these challenges, Pryor continued to make significant contributions to film, appearing in Harlem Nights, a comedy drama crime film featuring three generations of black comedians, including Pryor, Eddie Murphy, and Red Fox. Personal Struggles and Substance Abuse In the midst of Pryor's public triumphs, behind the scenes, his life was marred by chaos and personal turmoil. Raised in a household plagued by alcoholism and haunted by the traumas of his upbringing, Pryor found himself ensnared in a cycle of self-destructive behavior, teetering on the brink of death on multiple occasions as a result of his excessive substance use. Despite external appearances of success, Pryor grappled with inner demons that threatened to consume him. He frequently vanished for extended periods, indulging in a particular illicit substance, distinctly not the innocuous baking powder. In November 1977, at the age of 37, while reveling in his hometown of Peoria, Illinois, this substance precipitated Pryor's very first cardiac arrest, momentarily stopping his heart. Rushed to the hospital, he narrowly escaped brain damage, but the close encounter with death failed to deter his substance dependency. Instead, his consumption escalated, with reports indicating expenditures of up to a quarter million dollars annually by the late 1970s. In 1980, a five-day binge on the substance summed up to a tragedy. Recalling viewing footage of a monk self-immolating in Vietnam, Pryor admired the monk's patience and later replicated the act during an insane episode. Dousing himself in alcohol, he set himself ablaze, prompting a frenzied dash downstairs engulfed in flames until she was stopped by law enforcement. Rushed to the hospital, Pryor's wife cautioned against administering additional medication due to his recent substance-laden days ago, 
His numbed senses prevented the pain of severe burns sustained across his torso. Remarkably surviving, Pryor faced arduous weeks of skin graft surgeries to address his extensive injuries. Drawing from his tragic past for comedic inspiration, he incorporated the harrowing incident into his routines, humorously contemplating the irony of his survival amidst a substance-induced burn. Nevertheless, Pryor continued to hide the intentional nature of his actions, offering conflicting narratives in interviews. Eventually, he acknowledged his suicide attempt, recognizing it as a figurative death of his former self, ushering in a profound personal transformation. In his memoir, Richard Pryor contemplated the episode, acknowledging, I was still grappling with the same enduring challenges, underscoring how the external scars mirrored his internal struggles. Pryor had reached a rock bottom, yet unfortunately his health trajectory only increased from there on. Health decline and MS diagnosis. During the 1980s, Pryor underwent a dramatic weight loss, coinciding with the emergence of the AIDS epidemic. Given his reputation for offstage experimentation, speculation swirled regarding a secret battle with the illness. Despite vehement denials, Pryor's denials carried little weight, given the history of public figures denying their AIDS diagnoses until their final days. Publicly, Pryor encountered significant stigma, exemplified by the apprehension of others in his presence, symbolizing the widespread fear surrounding the illness. Beyond weight loss, Pryor grappled with vision impairment, tremors, and balance issues. The year 1986 brought clarity with a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, MS. MS, a degenerative nerve ailment, ravages the central nervous system, where the immune system targets the myelin sheath safeguarding nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord. This disrupts communication between the brain and body, heralding a progressive deterioration of function. Pryor's primary progressive MS, the most severe variant, offered no respite, robbing him of autonomy and speech in his successful years. Worsening and incurable, Pryor's MS surpassed the ravages of substance abuse and even the fiery ordeal posed a relentless assault on his well-being. The prognosis for this form of MS is low, with an average survival of merely five to 10 years post-diagnosis underscoring the formidable challenges Pryor faced. Pryor defied expectations by surviving nearly two decades post-diagnosis, yet many ponder whether this extended lifespan was a blessing or a curse given his declining quality of life. Throughout the subsequent 20 years, Mississippi exacted an increasingly devastating toll on Pryor's well-being. As his physical capabilities waned, Pryor reluctantly relinquished his stage career, the relentless onslaught of the disease targeted his motor functions and mobility, ultimately confining him to a wheelchair. His speech, once articulate, became slurred and incomprehensible as MS impaired the nerves governing facial movements and swallowing. By 2004, just a year before his demise, Pryor's battle with MS reached its zenith, rendering him completely paralyzed. Stripped of his ability to move, articulate thoughts clearly, or even consume food without assistance, Pryor became dependent on round-the-clock nursing care. The vibrant performer found himself grappling with the most mundane tasks, a stark contrast to his former energetic self. Compounding Pryor's physical agony was the relentless pain and discomfort inflicted by MS medical interventions aimed at alleviating his suffering often left Pryor in a state of sedation, detached from his surroundings. The confluence of physical agony, loss of independence, and unwanted medication side effects transformed Pryor's final years into a harrowing ordeal. In reflection, Pryor mused that his affliction with MS might be divine repercussion for his years of substance abuse. While speculation persists regarding the role of substance use in his illness, the etiology of MS remains enigmatic. Recent research implicates the Epstein-Barr virus as a potential trigger, suggesting that Pryor's MS may have manifested irrespective of his substance use. Ironically, Pryor's son viewed MS as a salvation of sorts, catalyzing his father's departure from substance abuse and prompting a newfound appreciation for self-care. Multiple sclerosis, a gift, a gift, yes.
Pryor's transformative journey compelled him to pause, reflect, and embrace life's simple pleasures, marking a poignant shift from his tumultuous past. Later, career and final days. In his later years, starting from the mid-1990s, Pryor relied on a power-operated mobility scooter due to his battle with multiple sclerosis, MS. Pryor humorously referred to MS as more shit, reflecting his resilient and irreverent attitude towards the disease. His last film appearance in David Lynch's Lost Highway, 1997, featured Pryor in a small role as Arnie, an auto repair garage manager, where he showcased his wit from the seat of his mobility scooter. Rhino Records undertook the remastering of all Pryor's albums from his reprise and WB days for inclusion in the box set titled and it's deep too, the complete Warner Brothers recordings, 1968-1992, 2000. In December 1999, Pryor made a cameo appearance in the cold open of The Norm Show, playing the character Mr. Johnson, an elderly man in a wheelchair who encounters troubles with in-home nursing. This marked Pryor's final television appearance. In 2002, Pryor and his wife and manager, Jennifer Lee Pryor, secured legal rights to all the laugh material, totaling almost 40 hours of reel-to-reel -reel analog tape. After sorting through the tapes and receiving Pryor's approval, Jennifer Lee Pryor granted Rhino Records access to the tapes in 2004. These tapes, which include the complete Craps After Hours album, served as the foundation for the double CD release Evolution Revolution, The Early Years, 1966-1974, released on February 1, 2005. Tragic Events Leading to His Death Just a year before his passing, Pryor faced another health setback, a diagnosis of renal failure, typically attributed to hypertension. This necessitated thrice-weekly dialysis sessions. The concurrent burden of renal failure and coronary artery disease placed immense strain on Pryor's already compromised heart. Coupled with his paralysis and wheelchair-bound state, his sedentary lifestyle exacerbated his health woes. On December 10, 2005, Pryor's turbulent existence came to an end as his health finally succumbed to his hard-lived lifestyle. Suffering a fatal heart attack, efforts to resuscitate him proved futile. At 65, Richard Pryor breathed his last, leaving a void in the comedy realm, yet his legacy endures. While he initially emulated the safer comedic style of Bill Cosby, Pryor swiftly carved his own niche, fearlessly speaking his unvarnished truth. His boundary-pushing comedy delved into taboo topics with a rawness and vulnerability unprecedented in the stand-up landscape. Personal life and relationships. Pryor crossed paths with actress Pam Greer through comedian Freddie Prinz, and their relationship blossomed while working together on the set of Greased Lightning, 1977. Greer played a supportive role in Pryor's life, assisting him in literacy and battling his substance addiction. Despite their connection, Pryor tied the knot with another woman while still dating Greer. Additionally, Pryor had relationships with other actresses, including Margot Kidder, during the filming of Some Kind of Hero, 1982. Throughout his life, Pryor had a tumultuous marital history, being married seven times to five different women. After his passing, insights into Pryor's tumultuous personal life have come to light. His battles with substance abuse and erratic behavior significantly affected his romantic relationships, especially with women. Growing up witnessing his mother's occupation had a profound impact on Pryor, shaping his views of women forever. Abandoned by his mother, he harbored a deep fear of being left behind leading him to exert control in his relationships to avoid abandonment. Additionally, Pryor's upbringing exposed him to his father's abusive treatment of women, influencing his own attitudes and actions in relationships. His substance-fueled escapades only intensified the volatility of his interactions, resulting in the breakdown of many relationships. Despite marrying seven times to five different women, most of Pryor's unions were short-lived and marked by turmoil. He was drawn to partners who shared his thrill-seeking lifestyle and enabled his substance abuse, perpetuating the cycle of dysfunction in his relationships. A notable example is one of his marriages, which was marred by chaotic dynamics. 
Prior to their wedding, Pryor engaged in a prolonged substance binge with his mistress. On the day of the ceremony, both he and his future wife, under the influence, arrived disoriented, with his wife nearly overdosing on substances. The following day, in a hasty decision, Pryor, still dressed in his wedding attire for a television appearance, impulsively considered divorcing his spouse. Known for his quick temper, he often engaged in heated arguments and resorted to coercive and violent behavior mirroring the dysfunctional upbringing he experienced and sought to replicate in his own relationships. In another well-known incident, Pryor's wife attempted to leave their home after a heated argument, triggering memories of his own childhood abandonment. Determined not to be left behind, Pryor pursued her, firing shots at her car and ramming his vehicle into hers, witnessed by onlookers. Following his arrest, his wife left for her own safety. Yet Pryor later turned this harrowing experience into comedic material, incorporating it into his stand-up routine. Despite the tendency of comedians to exaggerate stories, Pryor's narratives were rooted in his own life. His relationships were as tumultuous as any other aspect of his life. Pryor yearned for lasting, loving relationships to fill the void left by his childhood abandonment. However, any sign of independence from his partners triggered extreme reactions, echoing his mother's abandonment. Seeking unwavering loyalty, Pryor's response to marital conflicts often escalated to extreme measures, including public car chases. His controlling tendencies, driven by a fear of abandonment, ironically led to his partners leaving for their own safety. Pryor's challenging lifestyle also affected his children, who struggled with a father frequently absent or entangled in personal turmoil. Despite this, those close to Pryor admired his charm, intellect, and ability to form deep connections when sober. His personal experiences deeply influenced his comedic work, allowing him to explore themes of love, suffering, and the human experience with unparalleled depth and sincerity. Controversies, rumors, and unanswered questions. Nine years following Pryor's passing in 2014, Scott Saul's biographical book, Becoming Richard Pryor, made waves by suggesting that Pryor had come to terms with his bisexuality. Then, in 2018, revelations from Quincy Jones and Pryor's widow, Jennifer Lee, confirmed Pryor's romantic involvements with men, including a secret affair with Marlon Brando. According to Jones and Lee, Pryor was candid with his inner circle about his bisexuality and his sexual encounters with men. Jennifer said Pryor documented this affair in his unpublished diaries, suggesting he would have found humor in its eventual public disclosure. However, Pryor's daughter Rain contested these assertions, prompting Lee to claim that Rain was simply in denial about her father's sexual orientation. Lee added fuel to the fire when she made candid remarks to TMZ on TV, suggesting that the liberal attitudes of the 1970s, coupled with rampant drug use, led to uninhibited behavior, including sexual experimentation. In a controversial statement, she remarked, It was the 70s. Drugs were still good. If you did enough cocaine, you'd fuck a radiator and send it flowers in the morning. Further complicating matters, Pryor himself discussed a brief relationship with Mitrasha, a transgender woman, in his autobiography Pryor Convictions, referring to it as two weeks of being gay. Moreover, Pryor made explicit references to performing fellatio in his first comedy special, Live and Smokin', and openly declared at a gay rights event in 1977 held at the Hollywood Bowl, I have sucked a dick. Initially, it was seen as part of his comedic persona, but now understood as a candid acknowledgement of his reality. These revelations added layers to the ongoing discourse surrounding Pryor's sexual identity. Surprisingly, there are no reports of Pryor exhibiting volatility in his relationships with men, contrasting with his tumultuous relationships with women. It's possible that a more stable upbringing could have led to a less chaotic life for Pryor. However, it's equally plausible that without his personal struggles, Pryor may not have become the revered comedic luminary he is today. His struggles were intrinsic to his comedy, shaping a body of work that continues to have a profound impact on the world of comedy and beyond.
Legacy, Awards, and Honors. Pryor's ability to transform personal pain into universal humor revolutionized the comedy scene, inspiring countless comics to explore their own lives authentically. His influence extended beyond the stage, paving the way for black comedians like Eddie Murphy and Chris Rock to address weighty societal issues with levity. A trailblazer in both comedy and Hollywood, Pryor shattered color barriers and advocated for greater diversity and representation in the entertainment industry. Jerry Seinfeld famously dubbed Pryor as the Picasso of our profession, while Bob Newhart acclaimed him as the seminal comedian of the last 50 years. Dave Chappelle echoed these sentiments, likening Pryor to the pinnacle of comedic evolution, stating, you know those like evolution charts of man? He was the dude walking upright. Richard was the highest evolution of comedy. Pryor's enduring legacy can be attributed, in part, to the profound intimacy he infused into his comedy. As Bill Cosby purportedly remarked, Richard Pryor drew the line between comedy and tragedy as thin as one could possibly paint it. In 1998, Pryor was honored with the inaugural Mark Twain Prize for American Humor by the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Lawrence J. Wilker, the former president of the Kennedy Center, explained that Pryor was chosen as the first recipient due to his profound impact on American society as a stand-up comedian, writer, and actor. He highlighted Pryor's ability to confront significant social issues surrounding race and the human condition with both sharp wit and a compassionate spirit, akin to Mark Twain's approach. Despite his own battles, including his struggle with multiple sclerosis, MS, until his passing in 2005, Pryor fearlessly transformed his challenges into raw and often uncomfortable humor, emphasizing the power of truth in comedy. Pryor's legacy continued to garner recognition posthumously. In 2004, he topped Comedy Central's list of the 100 greatest stand-ups of all time, and in a 2005 British poll, he was ranked the 10 The Greatest Comedy Act by fellow comedians and industry insiders. The following year, Pryor was honored with the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. Beyond comedy, Pryor's advocacy for animal rights left a lasting impact. He collaborated with organizations like PETA to raise awareness about animal welfare issues, particularly focusing on the mistreatment of elephants in circuses and zoos. In recognition of his efforts, PETA established an award in Pryor's name to commend individuals for their outstanding work in alleviating animal suffering. In his hometown of Peoria, Illinois, a bronze statue titled Richard Pryor, more than just a comedian, was erected in his honor by artist Preston Jackson in 2015. This tribute stands as a reminder of Pryor's roots and his enduring legacy in comedy and social activism. More recently, in May 2022, Pryor was posthumously inducted into the National Comedy Center in Jamestown, New York, during a Netflix special titled The Hall, honoring the greats of stand-up. This recognition underscores Pryor's enduring influence on the world of comedy, a retrospective tribute to Richard Pryor. Various retrospectives have paid homage to the influential career of Richard Pryor over the years. In 2002, a television documentary titled The Funny Life of Richard Pryor aired, chronicling Pryor's journey with rare clips from his stand-up performances and films. Notable figures such as George Carlin, Dave Chappelle, Whoopi Goldberg and Joan Rivers contributed to the documentary, offering insights into Pryor's impact on comedy. Another television documentary, Richard Pryor, I Ain't Dead Yet, 2003, showcased archival footage of Pryor's performances along with testimonials from fellow comedians like Dave Chappelle, Dennis Leary, and Chris Rock highlighting Pryor's enduring influence. BT aired a special titled The Funniest Man Dead or Alive in December 2005, providing commentary from comedians and a glimpse into Pryor's upbringing. In 2013, a retrospective of Pryor's filmography titled A Pryor Engagement focused on his work in the 1970s. This retrospective opened at the Brooklyn Academy of Music Cinemas, celebrating Pryor's impact on comedy. Additionally, the documentary Richard Pryor, Omit the Logic premiered on Showtime in 2013. Directed by Marina Zenovich and featuring interviews with Dave Chappelle, 
Whoopi Goldberg, Quincy Jones, and others, offering a comprehensive look into Pryor's life and legacy. Pryor's life, both behind the scenes and on stage, offers a profound journey of talent entwined with pain. Amidst his achievements, Pryor's resilience in facing his inner struggles highlighted the healing influence of creativity. Despite his inability to change his past, Pryor transformed it into a source of positivity, employing his comedic genius to amuse audiences and address difficult topics. He leaves behind a legacy as a trailblazer unafraid to tackle tough truths with the liberating force of humor. Rest peacefully, Richard Pryor. Your legacy lives on. Thank you for watching this video. We hope you found this video enlightening and enjoyable. To know more about your favorite celebrities, tap on the link that pops up on your screen. See you there.